We're delighted to have you back. So this is our show on this FinTech Wise, our human human architecture with your host, Martin Despang and DeSoto Brown. Hi, DeSoto. Good day, everyone, and good day, Martin. Yeah, and this is uh, continuing to talk about what our breakers that just had his 70th birthday along with you, same month, same year, how it, a legacy continues to live alive. And we said we're going to go back with to pass it on to the next generation. As you see in the biggest picture here, we did. So share with us as we see you there. Yeah, well, we're going to talk about some of our friends today. And one of our friends is Ethel. Noda, who is a new friend for me, and she's the manager of the Breakers Hotel. And in the large picture, there, there we are. That's me on the left, and Ethel, obviously, to the to just to the side of me, and then Martin and Martine. And I was there at the Breakers, assisting with your travel industry management class. That's from UH, and. The students got to visit the Breakers, and I was there to talk about its history and talk about other types of history, including Hawaiian history and Hawaiian culture. And it was very interesting. It was very enjoyable. Ethel is a very sweet person. She is a very dedicated person. And she has been at the Breakers since it opened in 1954. So that's 70 years. And as we've been discussing, you and I, Ethel's work at the Breakers has been obviously very, very gratifying and satisfying to her. And she talked about how proud she is of the number of people who come back every year. They have a very dedicated group. She said it's about 80% of their clientele are people who have been there before. And obviously, for them to have been there that many times, many of their clients are older. But the clients love to come there every year, and the staff, who is very stable, and many of the workers have been there for a long time, enjoy seeing their friends, who are the customers. And Ethel told us that many of the customers, the regular, the regular people who come to the hotel, have gotten to be friends with each other and go and visit each other. So they see their friends there. They see their friends who are the staff members. They have a very strong affection and connection to the breakers. Uh, Ethel says they try to give people the same rooms if they're if it's possible because people like to be in the same room. So what we see here is the structure and the complex of the buildings really have a following. They have people who love them. They love the breakers. They love the buildings there. They love the way the buildings are built. They love the way the setup of the hotel is. And of course, they love the people who work there as well as the other people who come to the hotel. And to have that level of affection and connection among your customers is extremely important, but also the satisfaction that the workers are getting, like Ethel, and the affection they feel for the place. She's not in it to make a heck of a lot of money. She's in it because it's an extremely gratifying, satisfying job that gives her that mental satisfaction, and it gives her contentment. And if you can find a job that does that for you, you are a very lucky person, particularly to have had a job like that for your whole life. So there's a lot to admire about the buildings and the structure and the physical location of the Breakers Hotel, but it's the people that make it even a more wonderful story. And I also want to just say that I, I could tell that the students were intrigued, they were connected to this, and they, they felt that they were very interested what they were seeing. But also just for me, the fact that they have a pet cat at the hotel. And that's something that they regularly have. If one cat goes away, they get another cat. And so we got to see the cat who has multiple places to lie down and is treated with great affection. The cat's name is Whitey. Ethel, when it got Whitey from the Humane Society in Honolulu. So that is another facet of something like this. We talk about architecture a lot. We talk about buildings. But it's the people living in the buildings. It's the experience of the people in the buildings that's really the crucial part of this entire story that we want to tell you. And the Breakers is really embodying all of those things that we want to talk about. So I had a really satisfying visit. I had a lot of fun doing this uh, just a few days ago. And I'm very happy to have met Ethel. And I'm really happy to have been able to explore the Breakers Hotel 
and to see the inside as well as the outside and uh, just meet the people and have a really good time doing it and learn and learn and experience what they experience. So that's a really upbeat story. I was very happy to be a part of it. And uh, again, I share my birthday with the breakers. So obviously I feel a connection there too. Yeah, thanks again for all of that. As you said, I couldn't agree more from our fresh experience. It's sustainable as they like to the buzzword of these days on, on all levels, right? On a physical level, on the spiritual level, uh, eth you know, eth ethics, as you said, uh, the, the, the gratification is not greediness. It's, it's graciousness of the guests, right? Lots of fees. That's basically what it is. And you just told me before the show that it's the same for people working in Bishop Museum, right? That's not, you get, don't get paid a lot. So you do it for other reasons. You do it for because you love it. You have to. And, and that's very, very important. Again, and it was also very encouraging for the female uh, emerging, um, you know, managers, hoteliers, because they saw a woman, a power woman running this place, you know, in, and not being overpowered by male masculinity, which we have, unfortunately, too often, that people who rise up to it with their elbows, right, and they suppress the female and push them somewhere. And that was also very, very, very uplifting. Yeah, so, and I'm very. Hey, I want to say too. Ethel told us she's been the general manager of that hotel since the 1960s. So that was an interesting and groundbreaking position for a woman to be in that long ago. And I also want to say too, she is physically a very small and slight person. So she's running a hotel, not through physical presence, not being threatening, and not being loud, and not being able to push people around. She's obviously done an excellent job for all these years because that's why she's still there. So as you pointed out to, to the female students in your class, I mean, I'm hoping they're seeing the same thing that we're talking about. Yes, you can, you can achieve these things even in the face sometimes of discrimination, and you don't have to be a big, tough person. to have to intimidate people to get there. Yeah. and then. Having said to the guys in the house, this is not about reverse racism discrimination, you know, because it actually doesn't matter. We just got to watch out that the ones who are more vulnerable in society, you know, get protected more. But otherwise, it's really not a question of gender nor skin color nor anything, right? We're all one species. And that gets us then to the guys uh, that we want to talk about. And one of them is, is Richard Lowe. Uh, who we also uh, have been currently, you know, uh, seeing that his uh, his pump uh, of light that pumps, you know, the the liquid through his through his system, you know, um, needed some needed some rest and needed some repair. And we're very happy when we please uh, Michael when he can zoom in at the top left. Uh, we he now got himself back from restoring that system, which was in Queens. And yesterday we got him back into what's the place called at least originally? Oh, it's in the, I believe it's in the area of Kuakini Hospital. Kuakini yeah. Hospital started in the early 1900s. Interesting, as the Japanese hospital, and then it changed its name during World War II. And it does not, of course, serve just Japanese people, but it's turned into a whole medical complex in New yeah. Wanda, and where there are a variety of things that they take care of. So I believe that's where he is now in rehab in that Kuakini yeah. sort of complex. And, and we're looking on to, this really is happening for a reason, and this is actually a show that gets us to our other next friend, uh, Ron Lindgren, in a second here, because we named many shows after that. They're show quoted here at the top in the middle, Happenings for Reasons. That was volume nine, the concluding volume, right? And we're looking, really looking for alternative models in the future, because all these things, you know, rehab, you said, this is a term that's associated with a current kind of system that is more corporate and facilitates things. And there's a lot of driven is money, is the greediness that kind of runs it. So let's say, you know, Rich is not in rehab, but in re enriching, right? <laughs> Rich re enriches himself in this place for hopefully only a few more days. And then he's ready for up and running with us again. Uh, Bundes, 
first and foremost, taking him around and keeping him involved. He's always in the reviews that you and I are in. So we need him back for that. And, and that, that, that's basically the way to go. But architecture, again, needs to support that. So here, um, you know, in, in that new place um, where he is, his daughter made sure he got the bed that was close to the, to the window. He has a window and he has a view of the mountains and there's a tree in front, which he's very happy. But he was rightly so saying, is that window operable? And it was not. And again, all, many of the rooms are basically, um, you know, uh, having no view or facing the wrong direction while this is up the hill. So you could make it like our favorite, uh, you know, Olympic 72 in Munich, the terrace housing. Uh, you could make this so every every room has a view and, and also has sliding doors. And you have a, I mean, just copycat that use your term we don't like to use but just like be inspired and use the terminology and and you go actually Renzo Piano the great you know the architect who we like the most because he's the least stubborn and the most sensitive on many levels his uh, Renzo Piano workshop that's how his office is called is actually like that it's on a hillside and it's just following the hillside so it's sloping down it's stepping down why don't you make a hospital like that and the top left picture just says, I mean, Rich is actually looking at uh, what his life was, a part of his life, because he was a master planner in the best sense of the word for Victoria Ward. So the whole government center is a result of that. And by waiting for the limousine to transfer him from this facility to the other one, we had time to chat about it. And we somehow ran across the Frank Fazi government building. And and the other people in the discussion were not quite sure which one that is. And he explained it in the most beautiful way with his utmost expertise. He said, that's what we as the planners for that area basically made sure that Capulani Boulevard is not continuing and cutting this apart. We diverted it to basically make sure it becomes a part, right? And the buildings are, including the Capitol and the Frank Fazi buildings, are nestled in that park in that kind of Kevin Lynch, who is the, one of the main protagonists in this area here. And Rich particularly blossomed again, re-enriched himself in this space here because he was probably 10 times saying, isn't this beautiful, this greenery that's moving uh, in front of the, the man-made, you know, mountains there, the, the downtown area. This really got, got him going again. And if this would have been operable, obviously, you know, even, even more. So really, you know, the elements are important at any kind of age, but it seems like in, in very young age, you know, where the, even the medical world uh, is honest about it and created this term of nature deprivation syndrome. This is what happens to a lot. A lot of the kids, teenagers these days who are only on their devices and their kind of behavior shows that there are not enough out in the woods. And the same is that the, the, when it comes full circle at your sort of most golden era when, when, when you age, that you also, as, as they keep saying, you know, they want this connection to the environment. Well, now the environment that gets us to run can also be, you know, it's, it's, it depends. And Rich, who is a big um, uh, endorser of uh, our visions for the future of alternative systems as Primitiva 3, as we see in the top middle show quote, which we discussed with Ron and many, and Rich is a supporter. But he says, Martin, remember, I get cold. So we said, yes, within we make sure you're not cold. And another element to shelter yourself from, um, which is great because it's the source of life, that is water. But also, as they say, too much of everything is too much. That gets us to our friend Ron Lindgren, that I was so happy, I couldn't tell you, and I told you, uh, that uh, you know we all also have our senior moments. Sometimes we forget things. You had one on, on Sunday where I tried to tell you which day it was when we were supposed to meet with a student. And in return, you know, Ron, because he hadn't picked up the phone for too long, many months, or it feels like a year on Sunday, he picked up the phone. He's just as energetic as we remember him, as he always was, and uh, kindly, you know, and, and lucky us, keep sending us emails that keep us, you know, hopeful that, that he still is. But he was on the phone. 
And he was, uh, you know, was so enthusiastic that he says, yes, Martin, because we're going to move on with a class. It's going to be the Kahala on Monday, next Monday. And then it's going to be his Hale Kolani at some point soon after. And he said, yes, I'm going to be with you guys. I'm going to be make it easier, not on Zoom, but on the phone. And then Martin brings the Bose booster box, you know, the speaker. And we're going to have it with him. And that was great. We had and, and all the details he remembered about his Hali Kolani, like four inches or centimeters, you know, having to widen the rooms after it went from the Weyerhauser clamp ownership clamp. I had never heard before. And he himself said, Martin, you make this all pour out of my head all of a sudden, like, you know, a, a fountain. And, and he uh, and so we said, yeah, keep going. Share this with us. And before we were hanging up, uh, he said, well, wish me luck that um, the the weather that's supposed to come through, which is called an atmospheric river, is not going to be as extreme as they forecast. And, oh, well, on the right is immediately after Monday's afternoon architecture class. I checked the news and I saw that. And ever since, I was not able to get him back on the phone. So, Ron, hopefully you are safe. But again, the news said, you know, there were no no one seriously hurt, no fatalities. And, you know, property being hurt, we're also hopeful. Why is that with his house? Facility? Well, Ron has been living in a very interesting house that's a duplex. And it's very similar in construction style to the work that he worked on with his boss or his boss, Ed Killingsworth, created starting in the 1950s, primarily in California. and. So the ho- the house that Ron lives in is very much like the stuff that he worked on during his career as an architect. So obviously it fits very beautifully for what he wants. Well, as a duplex, uh, he owned his half of it. And it was something that was always worrisome to him as he was getting older as to how he was going to be able to afford to take care of this. And it was something that was really causing him some mental trauma. Well, fortunately. The other tenant has now bought the full building and is letting him live in his half of the duplex. And so now, as you were saying, in his golden years, he has removed the the, the worry of upkeep and monetary requirements has been removed. And he's now looking at life a lot more happily and with a lot more relaxation. And so we are hoping we're going to be getting him back on some of our shows here to, again, talk about his experiences as an architect, as a designer, and particularly on the buildings that he worked on that are located here, primarily the Holly Kulani, which was one of his biggest projects, I'm sure, that he was in charge of the redevelopment of the Holly Kulani and how it was turned into the complex that it is today from the low rise original Holly Kulani from the 1930s. Yeah. And that being said, analyzing that as research for aging and agility, you know, we all talk, including Bandit, um, that everything, again, happens for a reason. It's happening on all levels. You know, at, back at home, we have Suzanne with her bonus father, Stefan, who is our last urban farmer, who is currently in exactly the parallel situation half around the world. You know, he had heart issues, the pump, uh, and now he's waiting for rehab. And when we, you know, visited him over over the holidays, he was in his hermetic and closed room. And he says, I want to feel the breeze again. I want to be out there with my plants. Well, in temper, that's obviously more challenging because now we have winter and nothing is green outside. But he wants to be outside. So this seems to be really a clue, not lock people up, but actually, you know, have them be out and about in, 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 in all the, you know, the various ways. And maybe the whole kind of, you know, Western ownership that is so foreign to your Hawaiian culture, uh, the soda, right, just seems to prove wrong, continue to prove wrong. And we call it, it sometimes causes the terror of here, tropical territorialization. And Ron himself had, you know, self-diagnosed, yeah. analyzed himself and said, you know, Maybe the reason I was so down because I was house rich and money poor. And I had all these worries about what's going to happen. How do I inherit this when I'm not anymore? And he seems really, he says, he feels relieved from that. 
because now it's the responsibility of, um, you know, it's all taken care of and and his landlord takes care of things. So hopefully if there's some water damage now, you know, then just the landlord is going to fix this and you don't have to worry about Ron. Well, selfishly speaking, yes, you're going to be with us, but that's not, you know, selfish of us because, it, you know, we want to share with all you, our audience, because Ron has always been awesome and will be awesome. So we get we get them all back because we we need you guys and we need maybe then to con you know we all together need to research alternative modes and that gets us to the next slide for the remaining seven minutes because the project that we see at the top left there which we've been talking a lot about is the other person that we would have loved to have with us still um, but he left at least you know the physical earth and that is Steve out. Steve Owl was, by the way, best friends with Rich. They were partners in crime for all everything that, that Rich was looking out of the window is the area of, of his work together with Steve. And there's a show that we called um, Ward Wonder World. And it shows you if we would have let them or they would have let them do that, Kaka Ako would be paradise. And not that sort of terror of territorialization, which it is today, which we allow ourselves to say after many careful consideration of 320 and plus soon show. So that is something. So this building is is exciting us because, you know, when we asked, um, you know, we really tried hard, you and I, to get Steve out, but he was so relaxed and he said, I'm good. And you guys are on your own. So all the shows we had to do on our own. But Bundet got him out, right? And got him on 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 a great interview for his boundaries, changing boundaries, um, um, a website of the Shen Gallery. And and when we said, you know, for the architectural tour guide we're writing together with Don Hibbert and Bill Chapman, we said, can we categorize him as the hippie? And I was asking Bundet, who then got him to know the best. And he said, this is exactly how he categorized himself. So this building here is the is the Davies Pacific, uh, you know, center that um, is currently uh, going under a um, repurposing from former office to now residences. Well, you know, while this might sound the right direction because we have a house a housing crisis, we had actually Stanley Chang send us his newsletter. The second thing he quotes is. Uh, you know, the governor green again saying we need, you know, uh, more affordable housing. Well, Steve, if Steve would be around, I'm pretty sure he would do this with us. This, this one floor demonstrating alternative, <laughs> kind of a neo indigenous way of dwelling versus what's currently happening, which is get basically subdivided into the same old one, two, three bedrooms and studios starting at half of a million dollars. So we end up with, once again, uh, you know, the terror of tropical territorialization, enslaving people with mortgages. And there's no lanai's while he, uh, you know, uh, he designed it as, a, as one lanai. This is an exoskeleton here that if you take that glass off and replace it, you know, with glass jealousies or, or other screens, you get to breeze through, and it has a core that's structural, and the facade, the concrete, as we like to call the tropical brutalist facade, is actually load bearing, but also shading at the same time. So that's what we're saying. You know, Steve's one of the floors of that one would be ideal to demonstrate and try, you know, to experiment these practices. And we would get, you know, Ron in, and we would get rich in and we have to keep them warm yes so we're going to cocoon we're going to come up with cocoon whenever it's too cold for them they can be in there but otherwise we we're not gonna again um encage them enslave them in in many ways and again in units that make them make them lonely right i mean there's in my building here you know there have been people found dead while they were dead for weeks because they were alone and no one knew them. And, uh, and after a while, they said, well, there was sort of someone. And in fact, people said it smells kind of goofy on the corridor in the hallway. Well, that was them basically decomposing already. And that is so sad, right, on all levels. If you have people around, and that's why we're throwing out this terminology of co-op, which is cooperative versus core, which is corporate. 
is actually really a trend that sounds like, okay, where are you guys going? And we used to say commune, but that one got hijacked by politics and ideologies a long time ago. And people say, oh, communism. No, we don't want it. So it's not anything like that. In Europe, there's a lot of uh, developments. Suzanne, just our exotic escapism expert, sent us another development. We've been reporting on one in Munich a while ago that we got excited about. And there's another one. There's more and more coming up where people just get together and do it and simplify things. And that is the way to get it actually affordable, to keep it affordable. Bundit's daughter was having the great idea. She said, you know, hospitals are really in high demand here where young people, you know, can live. And they don't. Just like you work in the museum, not for the money. Young people, they don't, they couldn't care less for two bedrooms and high-end finishes and kitchen and whatnot, right? They can actually do the core right, the cooperative shared facilities as the Halimanoa, for example, where I was lucky to stay during my first week here. That does that. I am pay, you know, you got the communal kitchens, you got the communal bathrooms, and it's 25 bucks per, per night, which makes it $750 per month. How does that sound affordable versus 500000 and up for the new units they put in there? And I'm going to, we're almost... Uh, you know, and this I was taught, as you said, we continue to learn, and it goes both in all the directions. I learned this from Barga, who comes uh, to us from India, and he said, Martin, I found out that actually office space is cheaper than residential space. So illegally, some people actually rent an office space and they live in there as a cooperative. So, you know, you're destroying this here now under the, oh, we're making more housing. It's good. But what drives this? It's most likely, again, greediness versus gratitude. Oh, well, well, the only thing I can say that to add to that is I believe the entire Davis Pacific Center would probably be shifting over to residential. But I was told yesterday there are some long term tenants who have long term leases who are commercial tenants who cannot be moved out. Therefore, they're not doing the entire pervert conversion of the building as presumably they would be for economic reasons. Yeah, yeah. And the architectural studio we have going on, oh, they basically ask you if you could come back and be in a review that would ideally be Monday, but maybe it has to be Wednesday. So we got to talk about it. But anyways, we're all, you know, picking this up and digesting this and thinking about again, uh, more, you know, promising uh, models for the future that we can learn from the world that are going on. And this is, the, again, the co-op thing versus the cooperative. So um, the corporate, so the cooperative uh, versus the corporate on breaker. One O, one little O makes a lot of a difference, right? Anyway, we will uh, continue with that next week. Hopefully have you back. And um have you run back on Monday for the Kahala? If you have time to still to join us too, because we've all been there together. And until then, obviously, after this talk, uh, no surprise, please stay uh, gratitudinal versus the uh, greedy grumpy. Bye-bye. <laughs> <Bye. laughs>